Welcome to the OpenTunes tutorial. This is meant to be a very quick tutorial designed to get you started animating making very simple animations as quickly as possible. One thing that I should also make a note of before we get started is that this is being made on the day the software was released, so there's a chance that with time this could become an outdated tutorial as improvements are made and, and changes are made. I should also point out that I am not the leading expert on this program. I am going in as blindly as anybody else who just downloaded it today. Hopefully though I can give you enough knowledge to get you started making animations of your own. By the time we're done we're going to make a small or very simple short animation and render it out to a video. Check the description of this video for a link to the installer. When you first open up the program it'll look a little something like this. The way the program is initially set up is really not the best use of space or resources, so before we get started animating, we're going to edit our workspace and preferences to give ourselves the best experience possible. The first thing we'll do is go up to the Customize tab, click on Preferences, go to the Onion Skin tab, and click Onion Skin On. While you're there, you can also decide what color the previous and upcoming frames are going to be colored for the onion skin effect. I decided to change mine like Toon Boom Studio would do, so that the previous frames are tinted red and the upcoming frames are tinted green. You can also change the paper thickness. What this does is it makes the onion skin more or less transparent. The thicker the paper, the more transparent the onion skin will be. The next thing we're going to do is set up our workspace. Click and drag the Cleanup Settings tab until it detaches as a window and then exit out of it. Next, open the Windows tab and select Combo Viewer. The Combo Viewer contains a second workspace, our toolbar, our tool options bar, and also playback features. For this reason, it is actually going to replace the main workspace window. Unfortunately, we can't get rid of the workspace completely, because if we restart the program afterwards, then the Combo View features will disappear. I don't know how to fix this problem yet. The best solution I can think to do is tuck away the workspace into a little corner as small as possible so that it doesn't take up space. Next, go back into the Windows tab and select Style Editor. This is used to edit color swatches and brush behaviors. You'll also want to open up the Palette window. The palette window displays your color swatches. Because it is a horizontal format, I prefer to have it in a horizontal position underneath the workspace. In the same fashion, because columns and frames are arranged vertically, I decided to put them to the left of the workspace. This is my own personal preference and you can arrange the workspace however you want. The last window you'll want to open is the level strip. This is used to isolate frames for more detailed drawing in later stages of the animation process. You also use it to edit onion skin effects. One last setting to make sure you have enabled is to check Auto Apply under the Style Editor. You may notice that after restarting the program, some windows have changed size. You will also need to turn on Auto Apply again. However, for the most part, these settings should stay the same each time you use the program. One thing I forgot to mention is that we actually need to program the Delete hotkey. Go to Customize, Configure Shortcuts, Menu Commands, Edit, and Delete, and set it to your Delete key. I'm not sure why this isn't a default function of the program, but it's easy enough to solve. With all that in place, let's begin. In order to better understand this program, you need to notice how the frames are arranged. This animation program arranges frames in columns, which are essentially layers. You may notice also that the term column and the term level are used. Now the manual states that these are two different things, but as far as you're really concerned, they're pretty much the same thing. In order to create a frame, all you have to do is select the brush tool and draw within the workspace. Once the frame is created, you can extend it by clicking and dragging the small silver node on the bottom right of the frame. In order to contract the frame, make sure that every cell of the frame is selected before dragging the node. One thing you may notice is that even though we enabled onion skin in the settings, it still does not show up in the workspace. In order to change this, right click within the workspace and select activate onion skin. You may also notice that at first you only see the previous frames and not the next ones. In order to change this, click on a frame within the level strip. You should see two nodes appear on the top and bottom of the selection. If you have tinted your onion skins, they should show up as the color that they are tinted. Click and drag the two nodes to extend the onion skin in either direction. The further you extend them, the more frames will be visible. Note that you will have to repeat this with the onion skin each time you load up the program. You may notice that after you've clicked on a frame from the level strip that the workspace looks slightly different. This is because when you select a frame through the level strip, that current frame becomes isolated. This is intended for giving more detailed drawings towards later stages of the animation process. 
If you click on the frames within the exposure sheet, you will see the entire workspace again. One thing you should also do before you get started animating is to set your frame rate. Go to Customize and select Scene Settings. By default, the frame rate is set to 24, but you can set it to whichever you like. You can also temporarily change the frame rate by sliding the scrubber at the bottom of the workspace. By default, OpenTunes uses vector-based rendering when drawing, although this can be changed. However, if you want to use raster-based layers in a vector-based animation or vice versa, you have the option to. Right-click an empty level and select New Level. This will open a settings menu where you can change whether you want a vector or raster-based drawing. One important difference between a vector-based layer and a raster-based layer is that with a vector-based layer, the edge of the workspace is not seen as an actual edge. Here is what I mean. If I create a raster level and draw this staircase again, I can select the Fill tool and fill the space underneath the stairs without drawing a line connecting the top of the stairs to the bottom of the stairs and creating a closed loop. But with a vector-based level, I cannot do this. I have to draw outside the workspace in order to create a closed loop so that I can fill in that area. This means that with a raster-based level, you cannot draw outside the workspace. This indicates to me that raster-based levels are meant to be used more for background images or possibly non-moving objects. You may also be wondering how to change the color of your lines. This is where the palette and style editor windows come in. You'll notice in your palette window that there are already two colors in place, color 0 and color 1. Color 0 doesn't do anything, it cannot be deleted, and it cannot be edited. I'm honestly not really sure why it's there. Color 1 cannot be deleted, but it can be changed. Making sure you have checked Auto Apply, click and drag on the color wheel in the style editor and watch what happens. You'll notice that all of the strokes made with that particular color swatch change color. In order to paint with a different color, we need to make a new swatch. Click on the small icon on the right of the window that says New Style. This will open up a new swatch that you can then edit. If you have ever used Toon Boom Studio, then you should be familiar with this process. Now let's take a moment to talk about saving. There are three things that you can save, levels, scenes, and palettes. As long as you're saving your scene, you don't really need to worry about levels, but you do need to save your scene and you also need to save your palettes. You should be prompted for both if you try and exit the program. Now the reason you see several palettes in the prompt here is simply because I was messing around with this program before making this particular recording. However, when it comes time for you to save, you should notice that you have the same number of palettes as you do columns, or levels, or layers, they're all basically the same term. This is because each column has its own unique palette. I think this is because since this program was used for shared projects, it was good to have everything in a file that could be passed around, palettes, layers, pretty much every aspect of the project. Unfortunately, that means when it comes to individual use, it's more of a hassle to save everything. Saving the scene should be intuitive, but if you do not save the palette, then any changes or extra swatches that you've added will not be there the next time you load up the program. This can cause issues when it tries to remember what was colored with what. So try to get in the habit of saving the palettes as well as the scene, but the program should prompt you if you forget to do so. With all that out of the way, let's continue our animation. I'm going to start a new column and plan out our frames. This isn't going to be the best looking animation, but it should serve its purpose. As I mentioned before, now that we are on a new column, we have to create a new palette for ourselves. If you'd like, you can save your palette with a particular name and at a particular location so that it's easier to import both to a different column and to a different project. If I'm being honest, I don't know exactly where they go when you click save instead of save as. I'm going to skip ahead to having drawn a few keyframes. As you can see, you can preview your animation by dragging the scrubber at the bottom of the workspace or by clicking the play button. You can also adjust the playback region by dragging the two small white nodes to the left of the exposure sheet. With our keyframes in place, it's time to start tweening. Select the front frame, then go to edit and press insert. The only reason I haven't linked this function to a hotkey yet is simply because I'm lazy, but I would suggest you do so. You may also want to program a keyboard shortcut for the zoom in and zoom out functions as they are not inherent to the program, otherwise you can zoom in and out using the mouse wheel. One other thing to mention is that if we play our animation right now in our common workspace view, it plays fine, even though we've been inserting frames out of order so that they are numbered out of sequence. However, if we play the animation when it is isolated through the level strip, we get a different result. The level strip plays back the animation according to keyframe number. And because we have been inserting keyframes in between other frames, that means that its animation is out of order. This is easy to solve. Select all of the frames in a column, right click, and select Auto Renumber. You should see the frame numbers change to be in order. Now the animation plays in order both in our workspace view and our isolation view.
One thing I feel the need to point out is that one time when I tried this function, some of the frames turned red and the level strip showed those frames as missing. I'm not really sure what happened, and it may have been the result of me uninstalling the program and reinstalling or messing with some kind of folder. I'm not really sure, so hopefully it won't happen to you, but if it does, unfortunately I don't know what the solution is. Skipping forward a bit, we have now tweened our frames, filled in our outlines, and have a very crude animation to work with. It's now time to render. You'll notice in the top right of the window that there are different tabs for different workspaces, or rooms as the manual calls them. For right now, however, you should stick with just the main workspace that we've set up. Even though it's labeled as cleanup, it can be used for the majority of your work. When it comes time to render, however, you want to navigate to either the palette edit workspace or the X sheet workspace, because we want to access the render tab. Go to render and select preview. You may notice that the blue outline that was used to plot the ball's path is still visible even though we had hidden it in the workspace. This is because there are actually two ways to hide a layer, one from our own vision and one from the camera's vision. Looking at your columns, click on the orange tab to hide that column from your own vision. This will still show up on the camera, but if you click on the yellow eye icon, it will also hide that column from the camera's view. You can turn one on and the other off, or have both on or both off, whatever your preference. You can also click on this small camera icon in the default workspace to get an idea of what the camera will see when it comes time to render. Before we make our final export, go to Render and click on Output Settings. For now, focus mainly on the File Settings section. This is where you will decide your output name, location, and format. I decided to save the animation as a .move in the default output folder. Make sure you click on the Options button next to the output format to change the settings there as well. Once everything is set in place, X out of the settings, go to the Render tab and select Render. Because our animation is fairly short, it shouldn't take much time. The player should pop up by default and show you the finished product. You can then navigate to the output location and find your movie or sequence of images. And there you have it, your first animation using OpenTunes. Before you exit the program, remember to save your scene and your palettes. Before I end the tutorial, I'd like to make a few last notes. This video isn't necessarily meant to dissuade or encourage anybody from using this program. It was meant to be an unbiased first look at this program. I would encourage everyone to give it a try since it is there, but if you decide that it's not for you, then that's perfectly fine. But also keep in mind that this is a very basic first look at this program. There are a lot of different functions to this program that I'd like to learn more about and hopefully create a more advanced tutorial that uses different elements from this program. For example, special effects, camera movements, and the raster engine. This program came with two manuals, one small one which taught the basics and was used to make this tutorial, and a larger one which I have yet to go through. There's a lot to this program that I don't yet know about. Again, this wasn't meant to be an encyclopedic, in-depth documentary of the program, more of a quick and dirty, get started right away tutorial. Who knows, it could be that because it's now open source that it's completely different and a lot more intuitive in one week. But for now, I hope this tutorial has taught you something. So good luck and thanks for watching.